This is all of history on one graph. On the x-axis, we have time collapsed logarithmically, so we can see it all together. On the y-axis is the logarithm of growth rates. And you can see history is well summarized as a sequence of exponential growth modes. During each era, the growth rate was steady, and then there were sudden jumps where the growth rate grew by a factor of 50 to 200. During the forager era, humans doubled roughly every quarter million years from about 2 million years ago. 10,000 years, there was a sudden transition to the farming revolution where farmers started doubling roughly every 1,000 years. A few hundred years ago, there was a sudden transition to the industrial revolution where Industry has been doubling roughly every 15 years. If this pattern were to continue, then roughly sometime in the next century or so, there would be a transition that took 10 years or less, after which the economy would be doubling every month. And that would last for only a year or two until something else happened. That would be the straightforward projection of history following this pattern. What could possibly cause such an enormous change? One of the most common speculations is robots as smart as people. There are several ways that might conceivably happen. Probably the most straightforward way is that we keep accumulating software the way we've been doing for the last 70 years. I used to be an AI researcher for nine years, and I've been in the habit of talking to AI researchers who've been in their field for at least 20 years, such as our last speaker, and asking them the question, how far have we come in the last 20 years as a percentage of the distance to human level abilities? And they usually tell me 5 to 10% of the way, no noticeable acceleration. And at that rate, we're talking two to four centuries. But that would eventually happen. Some people think, I was described in a previous video, that it's going to happen a lot faster because we're going to discover some great grand theories of intelligence or learning. I'm skeptical. But I'm going to talk in this th here about a third scenario. It's not guaranteed to happen, but it's plausible enough to be worth exploring. The scenario is to port software. So today, if you have an old machine running software you like, and you want software like that running on a new machine, you could try to stare at the software, guess how it works, and then write software on the new machine that works how you think it works on the old machine. Or you can write what's called an emulator on the new machine that makes the new one look like the old one to the software. If you can write an emulator, you just move the software right over, and it works without you having to understand it. So the idea is to try to do that for the human brain. To make that work, we're going to have three technologies that aren't at the right levels yet, but when they are, emulations become possible. One is we need lots of cheap, fast, parallel computers. We don't have them yet. Second, we need to take individual brains, scan them, and find spatial and chemical detail to see exactly what's where, connected to what, of what type. Third, we need computer models of each kind of cell in the brain, a model of how it takes signals in, changes internal state, sends signals out. If you have good enough models for all the kinds of cells, a good enough scan of a particular brain, then you can make a model of that entire brain, an emulation of that brain. And if the models and parameters are good enough, then it will have the same input-output behavior as the original brain. That is, you could hook it up with artificial eyes, ears, hands, mouth. You could talk to it. It would talk back. You could ask it to do jobs. It might do them. If it was cheap, it would change everything. Now, I've been around people talking about this idea for many decades. It's a favorite bullshit topic of college late night conversations. And the usual topics that come up are, is it even possible to make an emulation of a human, a machine that emulates a real flesh and blood human? If you made one, would it be conscious, or is it just an empty machine? If you made one of me, is it me, or is it someone else? These are all fascinating questions that I'm going to ignore. Because I thought the neglected question has been, what would actually happen? So I wrote this book to try to say what. I'm going to explain my method on this slide, and then from here we're going to say well, all the conclusions about this world. My method is first, I'm trying not to be creative or original other than by asking this unusual question. Just straightforwardly apply academic consensus. Secondly, I'm going to not say what should be. I'm going to just try to say what's likely to happen if we did the least to avoid it. You don't have to like it. Not my job. Third, I'm going to focus on the robots, because that's where most of the action is, but we will talk about humans. I'm going to try to talk about the next era after ours that's as big as different from ours as these previous eras. I'm not going to tell you about the history of the universe for the next trillion years. After this era, other things happen. I don't know what. I'm going to focus on after a transition, 
Things are easier to predict when it's in equilibrium. During transitions, things are unstable. I'm going to use our standard first cut tool of economists, which is called supply and demand, which implicitly assumes there's lots of buyers and sellers for everything, not much regulation. Finally, I'm going to assume the emulations themselves are as simple as they can be. They're opaque. You made this emulation of someone, it's a black box. You can turn it on, turn it off, erase it, copy it, run it fast, run it slow, that's it. Can't do anything else. All right, those are the rules, and now let's hear about the age of M. First of all, I can tell you a number of things that are true just because M's are robots. They would be true for any world dominated by robots. Robots can be represented as computer files, so they can be immortal. Now, your houses and cars are in principle immortal because you can keep repairing them and they could last forever, but that doesn't mean you do. In principle, immortality doesn't mean actual immortality. It's a possibility. You can send computer files around the world at the speed of light, so robots can move around the world at the speed of light as a file. You know that if we accidentally kill nature, you will die. You are afraid, rightly so. Robots know that if they are made in factories out of things dug up in mines, if they accidentally kill nature, they do not die. They are less scared of killing nature. Finally, you can make copies of files, and that has enormous implications. First of all, wages very quickly fall to subsistence levels because the population of robots can expand so quickly. That makes the economy grow much faster. It can plausibly double every month. That's a straightforward implication of standard economic theories. If it takes a year to get to Mars and the economy doubles every month, nobody's going to be very interested in going to Mars <laughs> during this period. Humans collectively must retire all at once for good. Now, humans collectively own all of the capital in this world, and if the economy doubles every month, wealth doubles every month. So collectively, humans are getting rich, but individual humans may not own much besides their ability to work. So if they don't get sufficient sharing and insurance arrangements, they're in trouble. I predict that will vary. Some, some will and some won't. All humans start out as emulations. So their mental characteristics are within the human range. They are recognizably human. In fact, when you turn one on, you have to convince it that it's now the emulation, because a moment ago, it remembered being the human. But they are not typical humans. The emulation economy is very competitive, and it selects the humans who are most productive in the emulation world and makes billions or trillions of copies of them. So most emulations are copies of the few hundred most productive humans. That makes the typical emulation as productive as a typical Nobel Prize winner, Olympic gold medalist, head of state. They're elite, better than average, and they know it. They, they may look on humans with nostalgia and gratitude, but not so much respect, which is, if you think about it, how you think about your ancestors. Now, we know a lot of things about how humans vary in terms of who's more productive. We could just use those things to predict features of them. So they'll be smarter, more conscientious, hard work, workaholics, perhaps married, religious, because these are things that correlate with productivity among humans. Most jobs in an advanced economy are desk jobs. And there's, since emulations are already on a computer, there's no point in building a little desk for them. They might as well sit in virtual reality and do their desk job. And in virtual reality, it's very cheap to give them a luxurious environment that's beautiful and expensive. And their bodies can be virtual and gorgeous. They never need to feel pain, hunger, disease, grime. Uh, it's a comfortable, beautiful world where these are all desks. They're working all the time, <laughs> but still beautifully. Now, the most traumatic thing that ever happened to humans, arguably, was a transition from foraging to farming. Foragers are in rough equilibrium with their environment. When they do, what they do what feels natural, it's usually the right thing to do. Humans were able to become farmers only because we have enough cultural plasticity to change and have strong norms that tell farmers that they have to do something different than what felt natural to a forager. And that became possible with religion and strong conformity pressures. But in the last few hundred years, we've gotten rich, and most of the major social trends over the last few hundred years can be understood as us drifting back to forager attitudes as we get rich. The social pressures that turned foragers into farmers no longer feel compelling when we're rich. This can continue to be true for the humans, but no longer true for the emulations. They have need of the social pressures, as farmers did, so emulations go back to more farmer-style attitudes. It's no longer a Star Trek future for them. It's more of something else. Again, you don't have to like it. I'm just telling you my best guess of what's likely to happen. This is your life. You start and then you end. 
This is the life of an emulation who every day splits off a small number of short copies who do short-term tasks and then end or retire. This is much cheaper. So uh, the mainline copy has to rest through most of the day and then only works a part of the day. Each of these short-term copies, they are all work. We'll talk more about that in a minute. This is an emulation who's opportunistic. They make more copies of the versions of themselves, uh, which are in more demand, less of others. They don't know which versions will be popular and where their future is going to go. This is an emulation designer. They conceive of a large system in one copy, and then they split into copies who elaborate the design in the various parts, all the way down until they've implemented the entire design. In this way, a single emulation can implement, conceive and implement a much larger, more coherent design than humans can today, where one person designs and other people implement. This is an emulation plumber who remembers that for 20 years, every day, they only ever work two hours a day, a life of leisure. What actually happened is that every day, they split into 1,000 copies, each of whom did a two-hour plumbing job, and only one of them went on to the next day. Objectively, they are working well over 99% of the time. Subjectively, they remember a life of leisure. We know of many systems, like software and the human brain, which have the feature that as they adapt to circumstances, they become fragile and harder to readapt to new circumstances. Humans start out with fluid intelligence when you're young like you. Later on, we have crystallized intelligence, where we know a lot, but we hard, find it harder to learn new tricks. This plausibly means that emulations, even if they're immortal, they have a limited career length after which they need to retire. And then they are replaced by younger versions of themselves who have been training in slightly newer ways. So emulations see their future in great detail around them. They see slightly older versions of themselves, so they know where they're going to work and live, who they'll marry. So they know their marriages are going to work out because they see the other version working out. Now, again, this is you, start and you end. This could be you at the beginning of a party where you take a drug at the beginning of a party, which means you won't remember that party the next day or ever after. I'm told that some people do that. My question for you is, at the end of this party, will you say to yourself, I'm about to die. I was created as a new creature at the beginning of this party. That other person who lives on tomorrow, that's not me because they don't remember me. I hate being about to die. Why did I get myself into this? You could have that attitude, or you could say to yourself, that person tomorrow, that's me. I will go on, but I just won't remember what I did tonight. Both of those are valid attitudes. Now, this is the same structure. An emulation who splits off a short-term copy to stand in line at the DMV or whatever, and then ends. They can think of this new copy as a new creature who has a short life, and they hate that. Or they could think of it as another part of themselves that they won't remember. I predict they'll have that second attitude, not because it's philosophically correct. It's just the attitude you need to have to get along in this world. And it's a very productive advantage if you have that attitude. Today, it's hard to meet celebrities. Their time is very valuable. They're rare. For the emulations, if you think about it, it's easy to meet celebrities. They just spit off another copy and you interact with that other copy, and then that copy ends. The hard thing to do is to get a celebrity to remember you, because remember, that copy doesn't remember the other parts. So emulations can use this to an advantage, however. So today, if the president, your leader, tells you, uh, we must invade Iraq, and you say, why? And they say, can't tell you state secrets. You don't know whether to trust them. For an emulation, however, the president and you can both make a copy who go inside a safe. And inside the safe, they can explain all their secret reasons to you. And at the end, you decide if you're convinced or not, and you send one bit out back to your original version. Was I convinced? So your original version can hear, yes, there's a good reason. I don't know what it is, but apparently I was just convinced a few moments ago <laughs> that there's a good reason for this. So leaders can be more trusted. Today in our life, we have three stages of our life. We train, and then we work, and then we retire. M have the same three stages, but they can train a small number of copies and then pick the very best of those and then make many copies who work. So they can invest a lot more resources in training. It's, training is much cheaper for them. And later on when they retire, if they're not rich enough to just go on retiring the way they were living, then they can just run slow and retire slow. So I told you they could run at different speeds, and cost is proportional to speed. So if you only have 100th as much resources as it takes to go on at a regular speed, while well, you just go down to 100th the speed, and you can continue on and retire at a slow speed. Now, emulations can run at many different speeds, and they would probably clump into speeds so they can interact with others at the same speed. And that is true over a very wide range that they could spend more and then run faster. So they can plausibly run up to a million times faster than humans or down to a billion times slower than humans. This creates an enormous class hierarchy. High class sems 
at the top are really our higher status. They have many of the markers that we treat of as high status in our world. And at the bottom, they are lower status. And in fact, lower sl slow M's are kind of like ghosts in our literature. If you recall, ghosts are these creatures who are all around. They're obsessed with the past. They can't influence much. If you talk to them, they don't know much. So what's the point? There's ghosts, but you might as well ignore them. In our world, we clump together in cities, but we aren't all together in one big city because as we have bigger cities, they start to have larger and larger costs of congestion. It takes longer and more expensive to get around. Emulations, however, in a large city, they can interact with others using virtual reality without actually sending their mind or body, and that means it's cheap for them to interact across a wide scope, and their cities can therefore be much larger and more dense. So emulations probably do concentrate into a small number of very dense cities. Uh, for us, uh, because of the speeds we run, we have roughly a tenth of a sec second delay in our, in our reaction time, and that's enough time for, for the light signal to go across the entire Earth. So in virtual reality, if you're interacting with somebody else, you don't actually know where they are on the Earth if you have a fast enough signal. But emulations who run faster than humans, for example, if they're running 16 times faster than humans, they need to be within roughly 1,000 kilometers before they won't notice where the other one is for a signal delay. And if they run even faster, the circle gets even narrower how close they have to be. On the other hand, if they run too slow uh, and they train for a career, then their career will basically be over too fast because the world changes so by doubling every month. So the sweet spot on the trade-off between these two factors is roughly 1,000 times human speed. So I predict humans run roughly at 1,000 times human speed. Uh, and that means from their point of view, their world is more stable and changing less than your world is for you. This is my last slide. I know from previous experience that you guys are eager to evaluate this world and decide whether you like it or not. But think, your ancestors from a 1,000 or more years ago, if they had heard about your world, they would have loved it or hated it, depending on the first few things they heard, because your world is really just weird. So maybe you should pause before you evaluate this. Else, think about it, maybe even read a book on it. And, uh, but I'm going to summarize for the moment some of the major pluses and minuses of this world if you want to evaluate it first. Uh, they spend most time working and leisuring in virtual reality where there's no pain, hunger, disease, grime. Their bodies are always beautiful. Uh, there's a vast population finding it life worth living. If you ever said, I couldn't live in a small town because there's not enough going on there, that's what they say about your cities because theirs are much larger and more intricate. The larger economy can afford better art, and music, and all sorts of things. On the other hand, most of them are living at Malthusian subsistence wages, which is how pretty much all humans ever lived until a few hundred years ago, and how pretty much all animals have ever lived. So it's not strange hypothetical. It's the usual case in history. There's more inequality in this world, not just of wealth, but also of class and speed. They probably have larger, more bureaucratic firms, uh, less nature, perhaps, less space travel, less democracy, more religion. This is the age of M. Remember, it's not my job to make you love it or hate it, just to tell you what I think is most likely to happen if we did the least to avoid it. If you don't like this world, do something to change it. Thank you.